Hello, everybody. Welcome to this month's Specifying Practice Community. Um, I want to hand it off to Dave and Lewis to get started with today's topic. So, Dave and Lewis, over to you. Matt, thanks. So this is Dave Stutzman. Welcome to the practice group. Uh, thanks for joining us today. And uh, we're, uh, we're just going to be spellbound today by Lewis as he walks us through the <laughs> magic of Eats, uh, seeing as how this was his idea to present. And, you know, I'm just going to pester him as we go through and try to um, have fun with the presentation. So, Lewis. Well, hello, everyone. Lewis Medcalf coming to you high atop the Medcalf Manor in Hermitage, Tennessee, a suburb of Nashville. <clears throat> and uh, we were, David and I were thinking about ideas, and he told me it was my turn to come up with a, an idea for this month. So looking over the list of, of uh, sessions that we've done uh, over the last seven or eight years, I realized that we'd never, David, did you realize we'd never done a session on EFs? To which I said, I can't believe that that's really true. <laughs> <laughs> so we thought it was long past, long overdue. And, and so that's what we put together this year, so this month. So <clears throat> the first thing is to say, how do you say EIFS without the pronounce that acronym? Uh, I know a lot of people pronounce it EFUS. They like that uh, two-syllable version. But actually, uh, some years ago when I was in <clears throat> uh, Memphis, we had the president of the EMA, E-I-M-A, Exterior Insulation and Manufacturers Association, speak at one of our chapter meetings. And he agreed uh, with me that it really that most of them pronounce it EFS but if you want to say EFS we know what you mean tomato tomato it all comes out the same way doesn't it <laughs> <laughs> so one of the the primary things that we want that we want to accomplish to, today is to kind of warn you all our smart specifiers out there <clears throat> that the days when you could just, uh, all the EF systems were pretty much alike. There wasn't a lot of difference between the different manufacturers and all that was, you needed to do was specify the <clears throat> color and texture. And that was just about it. Those days are gone. So we're gonna look at some of the things that, decisions that you have to make, some research that you may need to do and to compare products because even a, equivalent products are going to have some differences that you need to understand and um, deal with in your specs. So we'll talk about the first the basic types. The first type is, of course, the oldest type. The, um, this, that's the one that I talked about, kind of the grandfather of the systems. <clears throat> Originally invented in Europe, and it's my understanding in Europe, they primarily invented it to go over old masonry buildings as a way to retrofit them with insulation. And it was brought to this country <clears throat> I've read as, as early as the, the late 60s, but I, the first project I work on, I think was in the mid 70s. And in those days, we actually, the EFS acronym had not been invented yet, or at least where I was working in Cincinnati. And so we called it synthetic stucco. Do you remember that, Dave? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, uh, because you and I probably started well, when it came to this country, uh, we were both probably working with it at the same time. And right, it was yes. referred to as synthetic stucco. Yes. Okay. So, and then uh, sometime in the 80s, they came out with the hard coat system. And the hard coat system is still a barrier system, but the difference is the base coats are much, much thicker. The insulation was always XPS, extruded polystyrene, that was mechanically attached. And then uh, the, 
this thicker finish system was placed over the top of it. And because it was so thick, it re actually requires um, the spacing of control joints about like regular stucco, conventional stucco. And so <clears throat> it never was very popular because it was quite a bit more expensive than the regular polymer-based uh, system that you see above, uh, some now called Class PB. But um, <clears throat> it was, uh, uh, I found one manufacturer that still does make it. Uh, I don't. The hard coat, you mean? Yeah. But uh, the major manufacturers or the larger manufacturers, I should say, have gotten out of the business. And then <clears throat> a more recent development, uh, starting probably in the early 90s, was uh, water drainage systems. Where, and we'll talk about those a little bit more when we look at the, the assembly system. But basically, it's a way that <clears throat> if water does get through the joints or whatever uh, in the system, that uh, the water can drain down behind the board. So instead of having continuous uh, adhesive attachment, uh, there is a way for it to drain, which was uh, by the mechanical attachment of the hard coat systems, you could accomplish that also. <clears throat> and then we're really not going to talk about it much to, at all today, except to say that there are direct applied exterior finish systems. Usually they are confined <clears throat> to protected uh, overhead horizontal surfaces, such as soffits or the ceiling in a uh, port cocher. Right, more as a, just a decorative finish to some sort of a sheathing board. Yes, you can apply. What it is 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 just the uh, the cementitious base coat and then the finished coat applied directly to gypsum sheathing. Uh, so it doesn't have any insulative value. <clears throat> one, uh, I believe there are one or two manufacturers who do have a system for putting on vertical systems, but the on vertical surfaces, but the problem with that is that almost every building in the U.S. anymore, except the extreme southern ports, parts, uh, zone one, have to have continuous exterior insulation. So it's kind of what's the point? One of the things that is not real clear is EFs with the insulation installed horizontally overhead. That's one of the things that you do need to research a little bit if you're planning to do that. Um, the NFPA tests that was basically invented for EFs um, sometime back in the 80s to uh, you're Make talking sure. about the predecessor to NFPA yes. 5 right? right? It was a UL. Uh, UBC. Was it was UBC. UBC. Mm -hmm. had, a, had a test. They invented the test, and then NFPA took it over and revised it and so forth. But anyway, that is uh, limited to vertical surfaces, and there is no test for overhead horizontal surfaces. But we all know that the insulation will burn and it'll burn like crazy or uh, the on the vertical tests eaves will burn upwards and then pretty much it runs out of it'll it'll stop it it doesn't it won't rip up an entire building and it doesn't spread to the sides in the on those tests uh, that's one of the things they test for but I was on a looking doing a uh, property condition assessment report of a county hospital in West Virginia uh, about four years or so ago, and I was surprised to see that someone had put true eaves with insulation in a large overhanging um, ceiling uh, below a um, patient room wing of a hospital. Because if, and ironically, it was the smoking area. <laughs> yeah. 
it's a, well, not that it's, so if there was a fire though from, you know, a, a bad light fixture or something like that, the smoke would have almost assuredly got up into the patient rooms. And so that's a little spooky. So, so uh, I, 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 I've talked I have, to a, I have a, a question couple. here. Yes. You have you have four different EFs types. I actually have on my other screen open uh, four specs, and I'm looking there. We have 16 different uh, EFs manufacturers listed on four specs, and I just happen to scroll down through. One of our manufacturers offers 15 different wall systems. <laughs> Bless their little hearts. So I can imagine that there are quite a few more, at least variations, on the theme that you're showing here uh, oh, among yes. all of the manufacturers. Yes, yeah, so we'll get into some of those. Um, but I wanted to complete my thought about the overhead horizontal use, because I really do think that that could be problematical. Um, and that's one of the reasons why I've always encouraged uh, the designers that I work with to think of using the direct applied DEFs instead. <clears throat> the um, and, de I and deal with the insulation elsewhere. And deal with the insulation, yeah, above, behind the sheathing, basically. Because when I talk to some of the tech reps from the major manufacturers uh, investigating this question uh, a, a few years ago, they all agreed that Basically, it's up to the local building official. In other words, but that doesn't mean that it's really making the building safe for the inhabitants, because we all know that the building officials, bless their hearts, sometimes miss things like that. But anyway, that's so that's an issue that I think people need to know about, that they may not be in really good uh, condition if you're trying to put insulated EFs on overhead horizontal projection uh, canopy. I mean, we're talking about large areas, a certain, you know, return to the window and thing. That's not a big deal. Right. All right. But one I, of the things that Jay can rely on, too, for help in that regard is go look at the um, evaluation reports from ICC. Because exactly. If there's a limitation such as that, the, the report will point that out. And one of the things you need to do is also you need to look at those for this is part of the homework, folks, is to look at those because some of the manufacturers require you to use 5 8 inch type X gypsum board on the inside of the wall as well as type X gypsum sheathing. Other manufacturers say you can put it over regular half inch gypsum sheathing that's unrated and the interior wall board doesn't have to be rated. Again, that's one of those things that varies from one manufacturer to another. Um, and it can be a big deal. I was working on a project in, in Texas, which had the uh, distinction of being the largest East project uh, under construction at that time and <clears throat> in the country. And um, a major uh, resort, hotel, and exposition center. And um, the uh, there was a manufacturer that wanted to get into my specs, but unfortunately, their, um, for them, their evaluation reports said that it had been tested with the 5 8 inch type X sheathing and 5 8 inch type uh, X interior gypsum board and that wasn't in the budget. So All right. They, so, but let's ask let's ask our folks that are online with us today. Commercial yeah. construction. Commercial construction. How many are actually allowing half inch standard type gypsum board anywhere in the project, rather than just specifying type five eights throughout? So anybody that's allowing half inch standard just raise your hand okay Lewis I see no takers on this <laughs> okay well I, I wanted people to be aware of that 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 is an issue and it, it could affect things so 
I just want everybody to know that you you got to do your homework. All right. Well, let's go on. That's. I think we beat this slide to death. I now. think we've done quite a good job of that. Yes. Okay. So warranties. Everybody likes the idea of warranties. Right. But what are you buying with that warranty? Really, is when this comes back, we've talked about warranties in general before. And it's really a matter of have you read what the manufacturer is actually offering as part of the warranty? In the case of EVES, they're being sold as a system. So is the manufacturer really warranting the complete system for its particular purpose? Or are we really talking about warranties for individual materials, meaning that the material is going to be as advertised uh, not and not defective, but not necessarily providing a warranty for the complete system? So where are we on these warranties, Lewis? I, the manufacturers each have their own, right? So and it's a matter of checking each one that we might want to specify. Is that correct? And not only that, but checking the systems by the same manufacturer because they're not going to give the same kind of warranty for the typical PB um, barrier system that they do for drainage systems, for example. So there are different um, different levels of warranties. All right, Dave, why don't you walk us through how to install EFs? Well, which system? You've shown only one. <laughs> All right. Well, it's kind of a generic diagram. Okay, except that we have to explain the one, because of how this one is drawn, this is a water drainage EFA system. So we're starting with the metal studs and the substrate, usually some sort of a sheathing board. It could be a gypsum or a glass mat gypsum, cement board, plywood, take your pick. Um, the, the next uh, layer, the bluish layer, is the water drainage membrane, and it, and it can be installed a couple different ways, and then we could have adhesives uh, in the ribbon, black ribbon, uh, like they're shown here, to create the drainage vertical drainage path as you apply the, uh, the insulation. Some insulation boards are formed with a channel as well to allow for the adhesive or for the drainage channel and that's another option so the insulation applied in one or more layers uh, most of the time I think you're limited to about four inches in any one uh, layer and some of the uh, systems are actually tested for some specific thicknesses so you need to be careful about uh, the thickness as well especially if you're doing build-outs for decorative cornices uh, to know how thick you can actually go with the foam uh, within the limits of the fire tests that have been conducted. Um, over the foam, we're going to install a, reinforce, a base coat and a reinforcing mesh. The mesh is usually a fiberglass uh, construction, and you want to just bed the reinforcing mesh completely in the base coat uh, to have that fully covered. Uh, apply the primer over the base coat and then the final f uh, finish coat which is usually in a cement acrylic base. Now these the finish coats have come a long way because we've got quite a few textures that we can choose from today. We have some that are actually metallic kinds of looks. We have other um, methods of finishing that can now give you a look of brick uh, whether it's tooled into the surface or whether it's actually applied uh, to make it look like brick, um, almost hand laid up as brick. So there, there are so many options available today that you really need to explore uh, with each manufacturer what sorts of uh, finishes that are available. Okay. Um, for some reason, or I lost the audio on my end. Were, were you still on? I was, and hopefully everybody heard me. <laughs> well, good. <clears throat> Did you mention that the um, the air and water barrier that most all the EFS manufacturers have their own system that's fully compatible with their adhesive? 
I did not mention that part, but thank you for pointing that out. And one of the other things to go along with that, that wasn't really until recent, uh, the East manufacturers today, uh, I won't say all of them, but at least some, are offering their weather barrier behind East products and other cladding systems. That wasn't always the case. Yes. And of course, a couple of the EFS manufacturers also have true stucco systems, uh, right. Stow in particular. Okay. So we have a question from Dave Metzger. Thank you, Dave. Oh, good. So he's asking, maybe not a basic component, but a critical component is a weep screed at the bottom of the wall to allow the water to drain out of the assembly. Yes, absolutely. <clears throat> absolutely. The, we have to have some means of getting that water out. Um, now, for finished coats, uh, traditionally, of course, it's just been a fairly thin acrylic-based textured coating. But now there are a couple of companies that are offering brick-like um, surfaces. And uh, one of them, Drive It, had a, a special event last week, last year at the convention for the SKIP members to tour their new plant where they're making this, where they actually make um, little thin brick that are made out of pretty much the same stuff as the base coat that are then glued on and then you point them up with a, a, a type of mortar so it's it really does look more like brick but there are a couple of other companies that have uh, systems where you you put up a template to block out what would be the joints and then you put on an extra layer of the finish coat to make it look like brick. Yeah, and one other option that's available too is there are companies out there making uh, extruded shapes that come with the base and primer coat already installed so that you can get um, linear uh, shapes uh, such mm -hmm. as like think of like a crown molding or a chair rail type shape or a uh, water can, table <laughs> right that yes that can just be uh, applied by adhesive to the surface to create those um, the profiles in the finish surface although the in the code they're generally limited to a total of four inch thickness so that's something to look out for if you need something heavier you're going to have to box out to get that a deeper one and also on the finishes <clears throat> there are a couple of companies some of the companies have uh, <clears throat> like exposed a uh, very fine exposed aggregate that makes it look more stone like and uh, so those are lots of opportunities for color and texture okay come on machine Okay. Of course, the first one, EPS, <clears throat> also known as beadboard, is um, the most popular one to date. It's, it's fairly inexpensive. The problem is if the face surface is broken, it will absorb a certain amount of water. Um, I was looking at a a recently completed multi-family residence uh, project uh, several years ago for the firm that I worked for and I was just distressed to see that uh, it was basically a, a reuse of an old brick warehouse of building in downtown Memphis but the some of the top floors the top floor had some eaves for the uh, higher end departments that had been built up there and uh, the tenants had bless their hearts uh, put screws through the eaves to hang planters hanging plants and other decorations and every one of those screws is a, a way of water to get into uh, into the system <clears throat> i hope they were long screws and they weren't relying on the foam to support <laughs> oh, the planters yes one of my um, 
one of the field reps who was working on one of the hotels that we had done that had eaves cladding reported that there was a leaking hose bib and water was coming out of the bottom at the of the uh, eaves like 20 feet away that it had gone that far sideways and the problem is that once it gets water in it it loses significant r value and it may take a while before it, it dries out but so there are ways I, of, of yeah so careful detailing is needed for any penetration that's the lesson from that yes absolutely not that you can't use it but you just have to be very careful and warn the owner not to poke holes in it Okay, and you had mentioned the extruded, the XPS uh, styrene, yes. often used with the um, hard coat systems, but we've also seen that where the substrates might require a mechanical attachment for the insulation. Uh, and I think there are some systems out there with adhesive attach attachment of XPS too. Okay, but and, you found uh, you found the information on uh, the poly ISO also, and that one was a bit of a surprise to me. So maybe you can explain that one. Yeah, it's not the foil face stuff. Obviously, it's it's faced with a like a fiberglass <clears throat> mat facing, and again, it can be installed um, uh, adhesively, I believe. And not every manufacturer has that, but that is another alternative. It has. Uh, obviously, higher R value than uh, XPS than EPS, and is more is closed cell. So uh, there are some advantages. I'm sure it costs more, but that's one of the alternatives. That if your team is working with an EVES project, that you need to think about. Well, and the other with the, the insulations, though, you have them not quite in the thermal performance order. So EPS would be yes the lower R value followed by extruded and then followed by ISO. Yes. Yeah, I should have done that, shouldn't I? You should have done the slide. <laughs> oh, no, no. Well, it just gives us something else to talk about. All, All right. right. Well, David has special insight about shop fabricated panelized assembly that he's going to tell you all about well a couple of different you know we, you can be somewhat creative with eaves um, i'll go back to the 70s my very first experience with eaves was we were trying to do energy retrofits for 65 different uh, buildings on an army base uh, letter kenny army depot uh, near carlisle pennsylvania and because we had these uh, army buildings, if you will, that are, are warehouse, manufacturing, fabrication. And if you can think about, you know, 1,200 foot long buildings and uh, they have a great place to stack things and it's usually against the exterior wall. So putting EFAS on this was a bit of a concern. And one of the first things we did is use EFAS, but immediately under the finish coat to help protect the insulation is we actually use cement board as the substrate over the foam. It worked and it actually uh, provided a bit more uh, damage resistance to the foam because at oh, that yeah. time we didn't even have the uh, impact resistant um, mesh as an option. So we have we have a number of different installations. You can be creative. Talk to your talk to the manufacturers and see what you might be able to do for uh, particular concerns. But the installation method, site assembled, shop fabricated, panelized uh, assembly is becoming more and more popular. Except that I was privileged privileged or challenged um, to detail the very first panelized EF system in the country. And that again was back in the 70s. The project still stands today. Everything is apparently still working. Um, uh, and that project happened to be in York, Pennsylvania for a senior housing project. The, the amazing part to me is when I first started the project, we talked to the manufacturer, said, oh, okay, so provide us whatever standard details you have. And essentially they told us, well, you're on your own because there aren't any. So anybody that's been using 
panelized ephus details over since the 1970s, you probably are relying on the details that I actually drew because they, the manufacturer took the details and turned around and published them as their standard. <laughs> they persist today. Shop fabrication um, gives you the ability to be able to manufacture the panel in the controlled assembly. Some of the things that have that you have to be concerned about is now you have many more sealant joints where you're joining the individual panels than you would in site assembly because the installation um, methods that EFS uses they rely on the ability of the coating to expand and contract it's an acrylic it's very elastic so the promotional material has always been you need far fewer joints in EFS finish systems than you do in conventional, whether it's stucco, masonry, or virtually any other material. You can almost do an entire building facade without joints. And you go to panelized assemblies and now you've just violated all of those uh, advantages that EFS springs for a continuous skin on the building. Now you have to rely on those uh, sealant joints to be able to keep uh, the building dry. That panelized project that you worked on, David, <clears throat> did it have windows in the panels? It did. And the panels and the windows were installed in the shop? In the shop. Yes, they were. So, and we all know that there's tremendous advantages for doing that. So. Right, okay. and the advantage, the advantage is, I mean, this was a, call it a mid-rise. I, I forget the number of floors, whether it was six or seven, something like that. But I think they only needed two panels to do the full height of the building. So the field erection went very quick. Ah. Oh, they were vertical rather than long panels. Correct. Interesting. Cool. Okay, let's go to the next. So we have a question for you, Louis, okay. from our friend Tommy Smith. Oh, I answered him privately that we are going to talk about the special inspections in a little while. All right, good. Thank you. We'll yes, catch I up know that, that that is special inspections are near and dear to Tommy's heart. So he probably inspired me to think of it for this presentation. So joint seals, especially with the in the old days with the PB coats. Uh, systems, uh, people were very concerned about having a low modulus sealant, and it should only be, and even today, should only be applied to the base coat. So you want, you have to write into your, <clears throat> they can turn the finish coat in a little bit into the, into the joints, but basically you want to have the sealant only attaching to the base coat because, and I was telling David earlier that when I was still in Cincinnati more than 20 years ago, there was a high-rise uh, residential building downtown, and I walked by and see, and I had seen where the uh, mod, the sealant must have been a very. I could feel it with my fingers. It was very stiff. That it would, uh, it had actually pulled the finish coat off the insulation and you could look in through the crack and see the insulation. Another major concern with joint seals is that how do you transition between eaves and brick vertically or horizontally. So you need to think about that and sometimes you need a, a piece of stainless steel flashing or something to, to separate the two systems. And then <clears throat> there's a a need for horizontal joints for um, to accept any deflection that might be in the building. And that's especially true with wood frame buildings. Again, uh, several years ago, we were doing a forensic study for a lawyer on a, um, I think it was a two story, but it might have been three story wood framed uh, suburban hotel, typical type thing. And the neither the designer nor the contractor had allowed for the shrinkage 
of the wood framing. And so that was part of the pay failure points is that you could see these horizontal lines where the EVE system was um, under compression and it had broken and were, uh, was allowing water into the, into the wall system. Yep, and the seals are really important uh, around the openings through the system. Uh, again, I, yep. I had actually investigated a, a similar kind of a hotel uh, out just outside of Atlantic City, and it was it was just absolutely incredible. We opened up uh, the interior side of the hotel because it was most of the chipboard was just covered with mold, but very low tech uh, test where we opened up the inside of the wall, sprayed the outside of a, a garden hose and just watched the water pour through the joints. Doesn't surprise me. I see that um, <clears throat> Dennis Burge, forgive me if I'm not pronouncing your last name correctly, friend Dennis, um, ask, do you see urethane or silicone sealant uh, typically specified? Um, my preference has always been for silicone because it resists UV and we don't know how long it'll last. I mean, it's, it's the manufacturer basically warrants it for 25 years, but it's been around for a lot longer than that. Whereas urethanes are affected by UV, they can get hard, and they can get cracked. Um, on the other hand, it's a lot less expensive if you really, really need a custom color. Uh, urethanes are a little uh, more cost effective, but they may need to be replaced more often. Good question. Well, and this, the silicones too are the ones that are readily available in the low modulus. Yes. Compared uh, to the urethanes. Um, back in the early days, back in the 80s, uh, Sika came up with a special low modulus polyurethane specifically for EFS systems. Ah, did it again. Oh, where am I? Joint sales. I don't know. I, I'm going to take away your driver's license. That's fine with me, brother. <laughs> well, here are a, a list of reference standards, and don't worry about copying down real fast. Uh, we can uh, a um, PDF of this presentation will, of the slides will be available so you can get it at that time. But there are a number of different standards that are out there. The, the first one is purely terminology. It doesn't have anything to do with the quality. It's just uh, terminology. Uh, and then there are some that are talk about the, the uh, the actual content of the materials <clears throat> of the systems and then applying them and so forth and then and there's some test assemblies and one of them now that you know I don't think I've ever seen or heard of I'm sure there are some um, a failure of the EFs uh, by um, wind loads, you know, being sucked off the building. Uh, the adhesive seems to work pretty good and always has. Do you know of any, David? Not that I know of. <clears throat> and we certainly have our fair share here in our area with Atlantic City and the casinos. Yes, yes. So, but it is uh, nice to know that there are methods of uh, finding out, uh, testing the that next to the last one, E2359, there is a test for that. Um, and then the one below, that's really a laboratory test. That is not a t something that you can test on the site. So that's something that the manufacturer would test to uh, determine the efficacy of the uh, water of the drainage system. And here's some, some more reference publications. <clears throat> if you go, um, we have already talked about looking up the uh, International Code Council Evaluation Service evaluation reports for the systems that you're considering. Um, because they will have limitations in there. <clears throat> they may 
that may affect your costs and installation. Uh, for example, as I said, not only the, the jib board on both sides of the wall, but they may also have some requirements in there about the, uh, the steel studs and the stiffness and some, some other issues that you need to address. <clears throat> uh, and then the uh, EMA, this Manufacturers Association, has a, a really very good technical site. Um, and they have a number of different things in there. Uh, you, you have to buy their guide to EVES with drainage detailing book, but there are also a lot of uh, free items. <clears throat> and then um, there's a wonderful article in the November 2015 issue, the construction specifier, written by a couple of architects. <clears throat> and it's very detailed. I stole a lot of ideas from them for this presentation. And I think you would benefit from that. <clears throat> well, any technical support in that kind of regard to make sure that you're getting the specifications, the detailing, the drawings correct with any material has got to be a big help. Even if you do have to pay for the information, it's often well worth it. Yeah, on the, the detailing thing, that's, that's not a bad idea because we all know that sometimes the manufacturer details are very generic or you know they're not r real complete and so there may be some things in there some that would be extremely helpful especially if you have any kind of unusual situation um, when I was in or Orlando for the uh, CSI convention back in the 90s um, they were doing an F.A. Schwartz um, toy store across nearby and they had a couple of uh, cubes sitting on uh, like a point and the cubes were made out of eaves and they were had bright colors on them and and so forth and it, so there were some interesting things about that of course eaves is one of the things you have to be careful about is your horizontal surfaces because it's it's not overly waterproof well, we had a comment from Scott Anderson. Ah. Uh, you, when you were talking about adhesive failures, he said there may have been some failures on the Gulf Coast, but I don't know if there were other mitigating circumstances to go with the wind. Uh, yeah, if it's a tornado, everything's going to be broken. <laughs> well, or hurricane in this case, since he's mentioning Gulf Coast. <laughs> well, uh, uh, Scott lives in uh, Birmingham, which is more subject to tornadoes than hurricanes. <laughs> All right. He's a good guy. Um, so code requirements. Tommy was anxious about this. and So it requires NFPA 285 testing. Okay, that's a given. And we even talked about how that test that's now applied to other products was basically invented to evaluate whether or not to allow EFs on otherwise non-combustible buildings because it does burn. Um, there's another there's another part to that. Oh. Even though it's 285 and it's uh, the code requirements, part of that scenario is 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 it within eight inches of grade and is it in a termite prone area ah yes because especially termite prone the code uh, limits um, how close you can get to grade with uh, exterior foam insulation yeah those little boogers can chew through like crazy <clears throat> especially if you got a wood stud wood frame building yep so special inspections and tests by the owner it does requ require them however one of the exemptions is you don't have to do it if you've got a drainage system over a water resistive barrier so that's a plus for using a drainage system even though they're a little more expensive but they're becoming extremely common these days. And then if you're applying even a, a typical barrier system directly over masonry or concrete, 
you have to, uh, and that's an exemption. You don't have to have those specially inspected. But, but yes, there's always a but. The, well, the but is the te the tests and the inspections are not defined by code. The, the code doesn't say what they are, when they're supposed to be done, and it doesn't, um, <clears throat> nor does it cite, you know, some ASTM or ANSI standard for the code. So some of the questions that, you know, come up are, you know, what are we looking at? What's the pass criteria? Um, does it include related work? Uh, how do you, if you're, Doing an off-site panelized system, do they have to inspect it in the in the uh, fabrication shop? Ah, uh, but the code giveth and taketh away, right? So in this case, the code is accomplishing exactly the intent. They're requiring the special inspections. The industry has moved towards the water drainage system, avoiding the special inspections. Yes. And so the only thing I found was I did find in my researches <clears throat> the North Carolina code has a checklist for the conventional barrier systems. And here are the three points. To correct installation of the reinforcing mesh, visually inspect transmission, transitions, and conduct water penetration testing. So that one at least is defined in North Carolina. And that would probably be a good uh, a starting point if you were going to do a PB system, a typical barrier system uh, that's not water drainage type. You may want to, in the field quality control, specify exactly what should be done for the special tests and inspections. And so these are for your consideration, but basically it's whatever the local building official requires. And it really is important to define what are the test conditions, what are the acceptance criteria, because otherwise if we're, if we're asking the contractor to perform the tests or if we're asking the owner's testing service to perform the test, they really can't accurately price any of it if they don't know what it is that they're supposed to be testing or observing and what the criteria is for reporting pass fail. Yes, exactly. So that I think that very odd that the code hasn't defined what is actually wanted for that. Okay, oh, we, have another, we have another yes. comment from Robin Snyder. Ah, uh, yes from the uh, southwest of the U.S. So one random issue in the desert southwest is the dark paint slash finish colors with low reflective values have been known to retain enough heat that the foam melts. Yes, Robin. And, um, as a matter of fact, <clears throat> um, Linda Davis, who was a specifier in Las Vegas a long time ago, uh, I was out there for that in one of those conventions, and <clears throat> she was telling me a horror story about the big MGM hotel. The, their corporate color is a very dark green. They had one wall facing due west that had no windows in it, no interruptions. It was the height of the building. And yes, it got hot enough <clears throat> that... <clears throat> The insulation didn't completely melt, but it softened and started to sag. So that that is an issue that you may want to think about. Of course, most the systems that we see are are light and pale colored, but uh, dark colors can be problematic. Or anything. So my my question to you, Robin, is: What in the world would possess people to stop in a place like? I don't know, Phoenix or Las Vegas in the middle of summer and say, geez, this is really pleasant. Let's stay here. <laughs> <laughs> well, David, I can <clears throat> speak for my daughter-in-law. She gr grew up in North Dakota with, uh, you know, minus 40 degree temperatures and minus 100 degree wind chill factors. 
And she said, enough is enough. So when she decided to go to college, she <clears throat> decided to study at the Arizona State University in Phoenix. And, uh, and my son followed her down there, got a job down there. They married and uh, they've been there, there since they married in 1993. <clears throat> So I, I like Robin's response. Well, that's a conversation to have over cocktails. I may take you up on that, Robin. Yeah, and, and David will buy. <laughs> well, thank we'll you, Luz. <laughs> we'll see you at the convention, I hope. All right. And, of course, this is what everybody had in mind when, when they invented Eves, is those pure platonic shapes um, with them. Um, uh, no joints, the epitome of uh, modern architecture, that whole movement. But as I warned earlier, I wouldn't run the eaves on that uh, soffit underneath it. <laughs> yeah. Use the direct applied system. Oh, one thing I did want to mention, I'm sorry I forgot to, uh, when we, I did not make a, a uh, slide for it, but there are certain certifications now that you can specify. <clears throat> There's a thing called the EF Smart Contractor Seal that's uh, sponsored by uh, the EMA. Uh, there are, are certified in EF's industry professional CEP, mechanics, CEM, inspectors, CEI, that's for the IBC Special Inspections, and the AWCI has approved union, tra union training for UCEP union certified plasterers who uh, are one of the trades that apply EVES. And those, those lists of, of um, certified mechanics and installers, well, the installer firms, are listed at www.eifs.com. Good information. I because if we can, if we can rely on at least an industry certification to be able to know the qualifications of both the installers, installer firms, and the mechanics, we have a far better chance of ensuring the right outcome for the owners. Because one of the cautionary things about using EVES is it's not especially cheap. It requires a tremendous amount of labor. It's very labor intensive because you think about it, we got first we have to put up the WRB. Well, you have to have that anyway. And then you run the insulation and stick adhere the insulation uh, to that substrate and the insulation is always going to have some issues, so you have to rasp it down, sand it down, and then collect all those nasty, persistent little beads uh, down on the ground when you do that. And then you have applying the base coat. When the base coat is, is wet, you put the mesh in it, wrap it around the, the, the edges of the panels. You put more base coat on it. It has to cure and then you come back and do the finish coat. So it's, it, it costs, a, it, it's pretty much comparable with a four inch wide of brick, brick veneer. The difference is because it's so lightweight, you can save significant amounts of money on the actual structure needed to hold it up. Right, there are always trade-offs, but you're, you're right. right. There, there are a number of labor steps that, you know, maybe more so than some other cladding materials, but you look at the overall system and make a comparison, both in cost and performance, uh, and choose the one that works best for the owner's intended needs. I see Phil Catalano has <clears throat> asked us to address the various levels of impact resistance available with different mesh weights. Uh, we didn't talk about that, but that is the case that there are uh, various weights of uh, mesh 
to um, reinforcing mesh for different purposes that will give you more and less uh, impact and resistance. And that's something that you really need to take up <clears throat> with the manufacturers. Um, it's hard for us to generalize on that, but there are, are basically three levels. There's the standard, slightly improved, and then the really heavy duty stuff. None of which will stand up to a weed whacker. Yeah, those. Yeah. But you're not, not supposed to have to not, a weed whacker. Wait a minute, it. you're not supposed to have yeast down in contact with grade. We <laughs> talked about that earlier, so stop doing that. And yeah, the the main concern about the impact resistance, um, Phil. Thanks for bringing that up. Is you know if you have EFs within a um, within say six to eight feet of a walking surface, you know, the likelihood that you're going to have some sort of a damage from people is probably pretty high. So you want to at least and consider, soil. yeah, and you want to consider that that fact and probably be looking at uh, at least the intermediate duty mesh, if not the uh, heavy duty mesh. Uh, to be able to resist whatever impact uh, that surface would be able to uh, be exposed to. Because you don't want to be back trying to patch the surface. Uh, patches don't always work out that well, uh, mainly because of the texture and the surface. Trying to match that texture exactly gets to be difficult. Yes. Okay. Well, thanks for everyone for joining us and uh, I hope uh, it was of some use to you. You know, David and I really regard these sessions as uh, your sessions and so we ask you to keep those cards and letters coming in, friends and neighbors, with ideas about what you would like for us to uh, confuse you about. <laughs> well, thank you, David and Lewis, again for another great month's session. Uh, with that, thank you again, David and Lewis, and thank you all for attending today's session. Uh, you may not disconnect and go about your day. <laughs>